Welcome to this series of lectures through the Queen of the Epistles, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Essentially, we're going to work through the letter to the Ephesians pericope by pericope, one passage at a time, looking at how Paul develops his train of thought and trying to trace his argument through the various passages that we encounter. What I'm sharing here is, for the most part, the fruit of my own inductive study of the Greek text of Ephesians. Now, of course, at a certain point, I've consulted some of the commentaries and looked at how others have taken it. But I've only done that after working fairly intensely through the text itself. And so about 90% of what I'm sharing is, is really my own take, my own understanding of the argument and the flow of thought as we work through the letter. We're going to be using something of a discourse-based approach. Uh, discourse analysis is one of my favorite ways of studying Paul's letters. And in particular, the technique of semantic structure analysis is a personal favorite. So I'm going to be doing a fair amount of that. Essentially what it is, is that we break a passage down into its component parts, typically its clauses and phrases, and then we analyze how the argument is built by looking at the main phrases and clauses and how each supporting clause develops a train of thought. We mostly do this by presenting a diagram of the text which represents the fruit of our interpretation of its semantic or meaning structure. So I'm going to be using a series of diagrams as I talk passage by passage through the letter to the Ephesians. Yes. An example to give you an idea of what it looks like. This is a diagram of Ephesians 1 verses 1 to 2, the introductory portion of the letter to the Ephesians. On the right hand side, you will see the biblical text presented. So all the way down the right hand side, we have phrase by phrase, the biblical text of Ephesians 1 verses 1 to 2, broken down usually into phrases and clauses. This particular one's a little bit of an outlier because Paul, for instance, is presented by himself and is just a single word. But normally, each phrase and clause appears down the right-hand side. Now, we can do this at the micro level as we're doing it here with a single uh, passage, just two verses. When we do a couple of verses, we're going to present the actual biblical text in the right-hand column, phrase by phrase, clause by clause. But we can do a similar thing at the level of a larger block of text. When we do that, we're going to present a summary or a precy, which will be in my own words, not in the words of the text on the right hand side, but still trying to represent the main ideas and thoughts in our passage. So the biblical text goes all the way down the right hand side and essentially is broken down into individual phrases, clauses, propositions, etc. Then to the left of the text, we diagram the main ideas furthest to the left. So all the main ideas are presented on the extreme left-hand side of our diagram, and subordinate or supporting ideas are then indented to the right-hand side and attached to the main ideas that they modify. And then we put labels. The labels are intended to represent how the different parts of the text relate to one another. I know that's a little confusing, so let's move away from the theory and have a quick look at Ephesians 1 verses 1 to 2 based on our diagram. Let's try to understand this specific uh, diagram that we're looking at now. So you see the text on the right hand side and on the far left you can see that there are three main propositions. There are three main ideas in this introductory part this greeting part of Ephesians. Firstly, we see the sender. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. But who's the sender? Well, the sender of the letter, the author, if you wish, identifies himself as Paul. And then if we scroll down a little bit, you see the recipients of the letter. So to whom was it written? It's to God's holy people. And then you can see some subordinate information about God's holy people, and we can unpack that in a moment. And then the last component is you see a greeting, grace and peace to you. So these three are on the extreme left-hand side of our diagram because they are 
the three main thoughts, the three main propositions in this opening greeting part of the letter. We can then see that we unpack each of those a little bit. So under the sender, Paul, he tells us a little bit about himself. For instance, he tells us that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus. This is there to identify which Paul it is and to give us some added information about him. It's descriptive information. And then we told, how did he become an apostle? And he says, it's by the will of God. So this is the means by which he became an apostle. Looking at the recipients of the letter, after identifying them as two God's holy people, we see that they are in Ephesus. So this is a place marker, and it's there to tell us which particular group of God's holy people receives this letter. It's God's holy people in Ephesus. So it's, it's identifying the recipients. And then there's some characterization of these recipients. What, what the author wants us to know about them or wants them to know that he knows about them is that they are faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's characterizing them in the introduction. And when we look at the greeting, grace and peace to you, typical Greco-Roman letters began with the greeting cherin, just meant greetings. Uh, Paul elaborates on that. He makes it charis, very similar, based on a similar Greek root. Charis ke irene, uh, grace and peace. So he Christianizes it and he expands it a little bit. And the source of the grace and peace that, God, that Paul wishes upon his readers comes from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So that essentially is what we're going to be doing as we work passage by passage through Ephesians. We're going to be taking some of these diagrams and showing how they lay out the train of thought that Paul is presenting as he writes to the Ephesians. Before I move on, it's necessary in the opening part of any book study to talk a little bit about some of the introductory issues. This is Bible scholar talk for background issues. What do we know about the letter that helps us to read it intelligently. We could spend a lot of time talking about introductory issues, but that's really not where we want to put our focus. But I do want to answer four simple questions quickly. Firstly, who wrote Ephesians? If we read Ephesians 1 verse 1, we are told that the author is Pavlos, Apostolos Jesu Christu, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And for me, that's good enough. I believe the Bible. I believe it to be true. I take it at face value. And the clear claim of Ephesians is that its author is Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus. There are many liberal scholars out there who disregard Paul as the author. They doubt or they deny that Paul, the apostle, the one that we know as the apostle, was the actual author of Ephesians. And they might attribute it to one of his disciples or his followers. The argument for this is typically based on circumstantial evidence like their assumptions about the Greek style or vocabulary being different to other letters, uh, sometimes their interpretation of the theology which they think is different to other letters. The reality is we have different style and nuances at different times in our lives and as we write to different authors, I mean audiences. So these things are not too convincing in my opinion. So as far as I'm concerned, who wrote the letter? Pavlos, Apostolos Jesu Christu, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, is the author of Ephesians. And we will work through the letter on that assumption. Secondly, who received the letter? Or in different language, to whom was Ephesians written? Now at first glance, this is as straightforward as the question who wrote it. Because if we read 1 verse 2, the letter is addressed to God's holy people in Ephesus. So we might think, well, if we take the text at face value, Paul wrote it, the Ephesians were the recipients. It's not quite that straightforward with the recipients because there are a handful, not many, but there are a handful of very early manuscripts that don't have the words in Epheso in them. In other words, they don't have the part that says in Ephesus. Ephesians is the most general of all Paul's letters. It's the most universal in tone and content, meaning it's the one that least obviously addresses particular people in a particular place, uh, struggling with particular problems. 
So it's, it's fairly general or universal in its content. And so there's a popular theory called the circular letter theory, which says if we have manuscripts that don't confirm that it was sent specifically to Ephesus and it's quite universal in its tone and content, maybe it wasn't sent to one specific church. Maybe it was a letter sent to multiple churches. In other words, not only to the church in Ephesus, but to other churches in the province of Asia Minor. This is known as the circular letter theory, and it's fairly popular and it's fairly credible. My own conviction is that the words in Ephesus are original and that we are primarily dealing with a letter that Paul the Apostle wrote to God's people in Ephesus. That, of course, is not to deny that this letter was also sent to some of the surrounding regions. Thirdly, when was the letter written? There are three places in the letter to the Ephesians where Paul mentions that he is in prison, referring to his Roman imprisonment. So he writes the letter from prison in Rome, and he was there probably from AD 60 to AD 62. That implies that Ephesians must be written in that time window. So by Paul to God's holy people living in Ephesus, somewhere around about AD 60 to 62. Our last preliminary question is, why was the letter written? And this one's much tougher because, as I mentioned, the content of Ephesians is more general than any of Paul's other letters. And that makes it more difficult to pinpoint exactly why he wrote this letter and what specific needs he was trying to address. My take, not necessarily shared by the commentaries, some, some might agree, but my take is that Paul is writing primarily to Gentile converts to Christ, Gentile believers. And he's writing to address two insecurities that they had. Firstly, their insecurity at feeling like they are second-class citizens in God's kingdom attached, added on members of God's family. So this issue of identity, are we somehow an afterthought after our Jewish brothers and sisters? And secondly, these same Gentile converts who had come out of paganism, Ephesus was a center of magic and occult practices. So we're talking about Gentile converts that have come out of paganism and still have in their worldview something of this mindset that evil spirits are a threat. And Paul writes to address, in part, their fear of evil spirits, even though they are in Christ. So we'll leave it there. We are going to journey step by step through the book of Ephesians. We're going to take it one pericope at a time, trying to trace the flow of thought using some discourse analysis methods. In terms of our take on some of the introductory questions. We are treating Ephesians as a letter written by Pavlos, Apostolos Jesu Christu, Paul, the Apostle of Christ Jesus, to believers living in the city of Ephesus. He probably wrote it from prison in Rome around AD 61, and he's primarily addressing Gentile converts on two concerns, their identity in Christ as full members of God's household and their abiding fear of evil spirits and the impact that they might have upon them.